We're recording and we're, we are not live. Uh, we had some glitches. So for those of you who tuned in on our Facebook page, you know that this is Let's Talk 2E Tuesdays. And we tried to broadcast live to Facebook, but Facebook was not playing nicely in our sandbox. So we're redoing and coming to you so that you can capture all the important information that you're going to hear today. So welcome to Let's Talk 2E Tuesdays. It's our third live broad, well, not live, wishing live broadcast with our <laughs> panelists who are speakers from our Let's Talk 2E Educator Conference that launched in January. Now the conference launched in January, however, like all of our conferences, it remains on demand on our website at letstalk2e.com. So our conference is for parents, our conference is for educators, this January conference. If you're interested, you can always access them there through letstalk2e.com or through our general website with understandingcomescom.com where you can see all the other stuff that we do, including consulting, and lots of education through videos and podcasts, our free monthly newsletter, Gifted and Distractable. And you can even go to 2eresources.com to find resources that are vetted and called for specifically gifted and 2e people, families, children, adults, teachers, clinicians, anybody can go there. It's free 24 seven and it's global. And if you know of an awesome resource, send them our way. Julie at withunderstandingcomescom.com. When you go over to 2E Resources, you'll note that it's organized in five categories, education, clinicians, consultants, associations, and enrichment. So head over there and enjoy all the resources that you'll find there. So our first Let's Talk 2E Live was based on the topic of understanding 2E. Our second was on classroom strategies. And tonight's very timely and extremely important topic is on cultural diversity. We all know that we're living in a time where this is, this is prevalent. The need to understand and the need to help diverse learners and people all over the world access education and equity. So Joy Lawson Davis, who's with us tonight, said it best when she said that we bear the burden for our nation in bringing this topic to light. It is a heavy burden. It is a, it, such an important burden and it's very emotional. So I'm so grateful to have Wendy Barons and Joy Lawson Davis with us tonight to talk about these topics. And by the way, guys, funny coincidence, the three of us are going to be a part of the mini SANG conference coming up on Friday. So go to sanggifted.org, S-E-N-G-I-F-T-E-D.org to find out about that and you'll be able to hear and learn even more. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our panel tonight. First, we have Wendy Behrens. Wendy is the gifted and talented education specialist <laughs> in the Minnesota Department of Education, where she advises educators, administrators, parents and policymakers. She presents frequently on comprehensive service design, acceleration, identification of underserved populations, and policies that support highly able learners. Wendy has received the National Association for Gifted Children uh, a, a Award, pres Presidential Award, and has held leadership roles in the Council of State Directors of Programs for the Gifted, the World Council on Gifted, and the Council for Exceptional Children. She serves on several national advisory groups and is the author of several books and book chapters on educational issues. Her most recent publication is Understanding Twice Exceptional Learners, Connecting Research to Practice. So at Let's Talk to a virtual conference for educators, Wendy's session is, who are the gifted English language learners and how can we find them? And we'll be talking to Wendy about those topics. Dr. Joy Lawson Davis is a gifted education scholar who has focused her career on addressing the needs of diverse gifted learners. An award-winning practitioner, author of numerous publications, professional development expert, and member of several advisory boards, Dr. Davis has distinguished herself to become one of the nation's leading voices of advocacy, working to dismantle systemic barriers 
preventing the fair and equitable service to gifted learners from culturally diverse backgrounds. Joy's session at the Let's Talk 2E conference for educators is nurturing the invisible 3E learner, black, gifted, and twice exceptional. So I'm gonna start with you, Joy, and ask, mm -hmm. ask you this question. So you used the term 3E in your presentation, in your title, and I'm wondering if you can share the definition of this term and why it matters in an educational setting. Well, first of all, uh, Julie, again, thank you for having me to be a part of the Let's Talk 2E conversations. I'm excited to be here tonight to, uh, to talk about these students in particular. Um, this is a very, very difficult time for our whole nation right now. It's just a difficult time. And it is a burdensome time, but it's a time that more than ever, we, can't, we can no longer just be advocates. Um, we have to be activists. We have to be activists to make sure that what we're doing in our schools every single day ensures that every child receives the equitable services that he or she needs. This group of students that you focus your work on, um, uh, Julie, and the group that I'm beginning to focus my work on uh, are students that, that um, I call 3E. I call these kids 3E students. And why 3E? First of all, we know that African-American students are the most underrepresented in gifted programs across this nation. They're the most underrepresented. We'll talk to you a little bit later about what some of the research says about their underrepresentation. So in my view, the 3E student is one who comes from a culturally diverse background, Black, Latinx, biracial, uh, immigrant status, uh, Native American, who is also gifted and has been diagnosed with another exceptional condition or has is showing is demonstrating traits of another exceptional condition. The majority of students who are served in 2E programs and who are advocated for are not culturally diverse students. And the primary reason is because culturally diverse students are not necessarily being identified and served in our gifted programs. So as a field, we need to pay more attention to 3E students. So how can I, I can say this because I know that these kids are not being served in our schools programs. They're not being identified. Their, their representation is just not there. We see study after study after study that indicates that these students, no matter what they show and what they demonstrate in terms of their capabilities, are not going to be identified or referred by classroom teachers who are insensitive and don't have cultural competency training, who uh, demonstrate racist behaviors towards these students, these kids are just not going to be identified. So for me and my colleagues, um, I wanna highlight the work that is being that is happening in this area uh, by my colleagues, Christina Henry Collins and Dr. Carlita Cotton. Uh, the three of us are kind of taking this on as one of our areas of activism that we want to work together to make sure we get this word out, that we, we're beginning to write about it, present about it, and ensure that Black students who have multiple exceptional conditions, multiple exceptional conditions, are not going to be overlooked any longer in our schools. So when you talk about not being identified, how do we address that? How do we change that? How, what, what can teachers do to notice, understand, recognize giftedness and exceptionality in our culturally diverse learners? Um, so we're talking now, um... Julie, about what are some of the barriers? What is keeping these kids from being recognized? These kids are who they are. They yeah. come to class, they come to school, they are creative, uh, they are insightful, they are sensitive, they have capabilities, accelerated capabilities in, in particular content areas, just like other gifted kids do. But they also demonstrate their own cultural traits as well. 
So one of the reasons that we know that teachers are not referring these kids is because they lack cultural competency training. We know that uh, around racism, we know that our programs are not set up to notice the giftedness in these children. We know that we're not training teachers well. We know not, it's not just teachers though, it's leaders, teachers, educational leaders, it's, it's, it's guidance counselors. I, you know, we read a study just a few weeks ago that came out through an article that discusses guidance counselors who are prejudiced against black students or students who have black sounding names. And we're not referring these students into AP classes. That's that's abysmal. It's abysmal that we still have people in our schools who work with these children every single day and have all kinds of biases against these students, implicit biases, but also very explicit biases against these children, simply because of their race, the color of their skin, the their, their income status. Um, the female, the black females who is trying to break the wall down to get into STEM programs is suffering because she has to work harder, show herself to be different in order to get into these programs. These students have to um, have to sometimes leave their culture behind and try to become someone else. They have to be assimilated into the majority culture. And that's simply unfair. So without training, without sensitive teachers, without leaders who recognize their role as culturally responsive leaders, who are monitoring and evaluating what's happening in schools every day, we're going to continue to have these problems, Julie. And without engaging these families and communities in a, in a very respectful and a valuable way, all of our cultures have, you know, have value in their community. There's value there. It doesn't matter to me whether there's income, high levels of income or not, there's value in that culture. And until we learn how to have culturally responsive community relationships, culturally responsive community relationships and with parents and bring them into this, into this game that we call gifted education, then we can continue to have these problems. So, you know, this whole notion of what we do in the name of gifted education is gonna to have to shift and change to be more sensitive, to be more understanding of all cultural groups. It's going to have to shift. Things, big things are going to have to happen in our field to change these conditions. So, you know, as you're talking, and I'm, I'm so many things are firing in my brain, Joy, because I'm thinking about, let's just take two E kids, black, brown, mm -hmm. whatever, two E kids. It's such a fight mm -hmm. to get oftentimes teachers and even parents to recognize the gifted part of the two emas so add a right. layer on where there's right. implicit or explicit bias and racism that the kid is doomed the kid is doomed and i would imagine in some culturally diverse communities parents don't feel empowered as though they can go in and advocate for their child talk about that a little bit and how teachers, not at all how can tell yes absolutely about? julie that you know that's that's one of the areas of deep concern for me, and it has been for a long time. You know, I did my my master's thesis and my my doc dissertation around of uh, the the impact of families on achievement. I read everything that had been published about the black family and their role in nurturing achievement of our students. But what we haven't done in schools is we haven't recognized the black family as an integral part. Of, of our of our community's uh, advancement over the years. We just, the schools have just not recognized that. And so you're right, uh, black families, when it comes to gifted programming or entering into this field, they don't feel empowered. They don't feel as if it belongs to them. There's a sense that this is not theirs, that it belongs to this other set of parents, other families, but it doesn't belong to them. So they're not as, willing oftentimes to to try to step into this world that they don't feel welcome in and so again i you know i work with parents i advise parents i a host uh i um i present at parent conferences and you know many times this is what i hear from from parents of color for black parents in particular i hear this from them that it doesn't i don't feel comfortable in 
in that program. They're not setting that programming for my child. Or I've had to fight. I've had to fight so hard just to get my kid identified as gifted. It, or if my child is already uh, has already been diagnosed with a a multi, another exceptional condition, these people are absolutely, Dr. Joy, they're not absolutely not going to look at my child's giftedness. They're absolutely not going to look at that. And so I've had to continuously fight. I've spoken to parents, Julie, where their child has um, has on uh, their intelligence assessment. You know, they administer and and you know individual IQ testing for you know for, for for to get diagnosis for some special education conditions and i've talked to parents whose child has a who would be qualified for any program in his nation if he or she was white and they had the, the iq scores that these kids have i'm serious i'm serious i've advised these parents and they are so frustrated they're so frustrated so what we, we're beginning to see is parents who pull their children out of regular schooling out of public schooling they're doing more homeschooling now they're going into private institutions but only if they feel like they're going to be welcome and they're going to be able to advocate for their children so you know there's a wall there's a barrier in our schools that that is not allowing uh for parents of color for black parents in particular to enter in and become uh advocates for their children this their, this wall is there and it, and it's there consistently uh in in almost every part of the nation that i've you know advised and and talked to parents about so we yes we do we have a, a long way to go we we have to bring parents to the table we have to allow them to come in talk about their culture be the cultural agent you know let them be the cultural agent what we don't know yeah. about particular cultures as as yeah, let them be the cultural agent. But they need to be let them be the ones they, who can tell us about their cultures. I, they I, need I, to be comfortable, Julie. They, You're right. They, right. They need to be invited, you know. Sure. And so so let me ask you, is that part of cultural competency mm -hmm. training? I want you to talk a little bit about cultural competency training and how can schools have that in their in their schools for their teachers and for their administrators and for their parents. Yes, cultural competency training. Cultural competency training does have a component that has to do with family and community engagement. We need to get a, get to have a better sense for who families and communities are that are unlike our own. So what we recommend are cross-cultural experiences. We recommend that school personnel, you know, go into the community, visit community uh, events, go to places where the community lives and be a part of the community for a period of time so that their understandings will increase and they will embrace these communities that are different from theirs. With this cultural mismatch going on, where um, where the, the teachers or the administrators are from one culture and the students they serve are from another culture, it's called cultural mismatch. That you know that has that 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 creates a wedge between the school and the families. And so yes, with cultural competency training, we discuss and we share examples of the value of uh, cross cultural training, the value of bringing families in, as you say, inviting them in, and then the value of taking gifted education and and uh, special education training and advocacy out to the community. You know, out to the community so that they can embrace in these ideas a lot better than they have. There's just so many layers and I feel like there's so much misunderstanding just at even understanding what gifted really means versus high achievement. What on understanding right. the strengths of two right. E differential learners, neuro neurodiverse kids. And then you add the three neurodiversity mm -hmm. and it's like yet another layer and it and it and it's almost as though it's like such a beautiful invitation joy to learn about difference to show <laughs> empathy to understand and to like who like how great to learn we, to learn about different cultures but in right. fact and different mm -hmm. ways of learning but in fact people shy away mm -hmm. from what they don't know or they have these implicit and explicit biases. So I do have a question that somebody exactly. that, that uh, Victoria Rose has shared. Um, 
that somebody in the chat in Facebook who can't watch us right now, but will watch the recording. So they're wondering what are some good resources. Yes. What are some good resources for learning about 3E? They read and enjoyed Joy's recent articles and Scott Peterson's 2018 book. So what are some other mm -hmm. um, resources that you can share? Well, right, right now, I would suggest that people begin taking a look at some of the work that Christina Henry Collins is doing. Uh, Christina, Carlita, uh, Cotton, and myself have a chapter that will be coming out very soon. Uh, Carlita Cotton and I just wrote a, a, an article for the Variations magazine that comes out of the Bridges School in California. And so um, we're, we're beginning to build, uh, you know, a library of, of resources and also beginning to reach out to more colleagues so that they can take this on um, as, as an area of, of interest and concern. So uh, we're growing, but we're not quite, quite there yet. I'd also advise, though, one other thing. Uh, I'd also advise that individuals take a look at the, um, at the story of the life of Amanda Gorman. Amanda was a young lady who, who, who recited that awesome poem at the um, inauguration of, of President Biden. You, if you hear her story, you'll hear the story of a 2E student. It just so happened that Amanda's family uh, was able to, were able to get her the resources she needed for her speech impediment. And then also at the same time, you know, develop her gifts uh, in the area of, of, of language. And um, so, she, but she's an ideal uh, person to look at when you look at the benefits of what can happen if that person's uh, gifts are nurtured at the same time that the areas where they, you know, they have a need uh, are nurtured and, and taken care of. What an incredibly inspirational story. And not only her gifts developed, but her challenge was developed into a gift, which is pretty awesome. Exactly. So, Hi, Wendy. Exactly. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad you're Hi, with Wendy. us. I know you, the allergies are, are strong this time of year, and we can all relate. <laughs> and I'm glad you're back with us and that you're okay. So, I am. Yeah, awesome. Mm -hmm. So let me mm -hmm. switch. You, you, heard, you heard our conversation, and I was like, I know Wendy has stuff to talk about that has to do with health <laughs> work. And I mean, part of your, and by the way, I will say that Christina Collins is also a speaker at Let's Talk 2E. So she has a lot to say. And right, Kyle I Hill remember is that. also a speaker at Let's Talk 2E, <laughs> as well as Joseph, Joseph Olan. <laughs> so we have a lot of representation right. talking about the importance. Um, so Wendy, mm -hmm. let's just start. I know you're dying to jump in on the culture conversation, but can we just, <laughs> I know you are, and I'm, so you're gonna. But I just want to ask you, can you can you just define EL learners for us? Julie, I can, but I'd like for you and um, your listeners to, to learn something new, to think about something new other than EL. So many of us think of English learners or English as a second language as a deficit approach. So I'm going to ask you to take a different avenue and refer to these students as multilingual. Beautiful. So let's talk about that. And um, this is not, you know, this is not brain surgery here. This is a very concrete um, definition that multilingual students already know one or possibly more language. And they are adding English to their um, to their knowledge. So, in other words, these kids sometimes are proficient in their own language, but other times, frankly, some of these students are actually learning a new language while they are also learning their home language or their heritage language. But multilingual is really um, a different approach, and I and I know that your listeners will. Um, will appreciate this, that um, when we talk about a difference in a student, we talk about the student first, and then either the difference or the disability. So a student who has autism is a much more strength-based, positive way of talking about a student rather than saying an autistic student. Well, when we talk about multilingual 
students. These are, we're recognizing a talent that already exists. It's not easy to be bilingual. And yet that's what we're asking these kids to be. Um, in the United States, the fastest growing population, according to the census, are people who are new to this country. We see greater numbers of children that are learning English and are new to the United States than ever before. And those numbers are projected to grow in so very many ways. And so for us to be able to talk about finding the gifted among students who are multilingual is really important. And um, it requires us to think about their strengths. It requires us to think about the impact of culture. It requires us to know our students in ways that perhaps we haven't before. Now, Joy talked a little bit about cultural competency and um, <clears throat> understanding our multiple, multiple linguals also requires cultural competency. We need to know who those kids are. We need to know about them. We need to know about their background. We need to know about their culture and how it impacts. So we also need to know about their environment. How did they grow up? How are they growing up? What's going on at home? And in many cases, many of our multilingual students are speaking their heritage language at home and English when they come to school. That's not a bad thing because we want them to retain their cultural identity. We want them to retain their heritage and their pride. But um, that's a lot going on, especially when we're talking about young children who are entering school sometimes for the very first time. So multilingual kids, as I said, are kids who know one language and are adding at least, they know at least one language and they're adding another and that language happens to be English. I hope that we can talk about these kids as multilinguals because frankly, there's a little bit of, of um, uh, even in the field of um, teaching kids to speak English, it feels like there's a, a change in descriptors almost on a, you know, on a predictable cycle. Sometimes they're ELs, sometimes they're ELLs, sometimes they're ESLs. And if we would just call them multilingual, we have an opportunity to recognize their talents. Yeah, that's just like the strength mm -hmm. based that's, that's way of- Simple as that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it is a strength-based approach. Mm -hmm. And I think that when we talk it about is. these it kids is. in school, mm -hmm. I think, you know, we can't pretend that they have, that they've grown up in the same environment. We can't pretend, particularly for those of our kids that are coming to school having escaped trauma and civil unrest in their country, sometimes war, mm -hmm. sometimes separation from parents and families, the people mm -hmm. who normally they would go to in order to seek comfort. Um, we can't separate those kids. Even if they're very young kids, we can't mm -hmm. separate them from their experiences and the environment in which they've grown up or are growing up. I, you know, mm -hmm. There were, mm -hmm. I remember during your session, Wendy, that you talked about um, cultural differences and sort of these faux pas that teachers make. Yeah. And I thought that was so enlightening. Mm -hmm. Can you share some, some of those assumptions? Sure. And maybe what's, what's really a more accurate way sure. to allow these kids to celebrate authentically their, uh, their heritage? You know, um, we have a very specific way of um, presenting ourselves as teachers in many cases. I'm not gonna tell you it's the best way, but I think it's, it's a way where we have certain expectations. And um, I'll give you a very concrete example that in some cultures, um, looking a teacher directly in the eye is considered to be a sign of disrespect. It's a challenge to authority. And yet, many of our teachers expect a student to look at them 
directly in the eye. And so not understanding those cultural nuances, not understanding that it's not a sign of res- disrespect. Sometimes it is a sign of respect. Um, <clears throat> when I was doing research on, uh, for instance, um, our American Indian population, I discovered that that is a very <laughs> common misconception that people have. Uh, they'll say that a student mm-hmm. won't look at them. Well, they're being respectful. They've been taught not to look their elders in the eye. Um, As an adult, that's right. <clears throat> that's right. Mm-hmm. And that's often um, something that we have uh, missed with some of our South American students who have arrived in the United States. They too are reluctant to look someone in the eye. And so Mm-hmm. looking for those miscues, looking for the cues, understanding, you know, understanding who we're working with, <laughs> understanding our students is the key to everything. And I, I think that Joy would probably agree with me when I say this is that we have been guilty as a profession of not knowing our kids, not knowing our students, not taking the right. time Mm-hmm. Not taking the time to get to know them, to, get to, to understand know them. their culture, understand their their mm-hmm. their their dreams, their wishes, their challenges, and of course, mm-hmm. to understand um, their family circumstances. And mm-hmm. you know, as we um, as we talk with teachers, so often we discover that. The mistakes that they make are not intentional. The mistakes that they make are assumptions based on their lived experience. Unfortunately, they don't know the lived experiences of their students. And in many instances, as Joyce pointed out, the student and the teacher come Mm -hmm. from totally different backgrounds, Totally. totally different cultural identities and understanding. Um, In Minnesota, where I live, Mm -hmm. there's been a lot of conversation over the years about what students were allowed to wear when they graduate from high school. And in many cultures, there are, um, there's, um, it's a sign of respect to be able to wear um, a stole that has certain colors that is a, um, Mm -hmm. that identifies the student's culture that identifies the student's heritage, mm-hmm. honors their ancestors. Um, in many cases, it's worn with such pride because we are talking about children who are and oftentimes the first in their family to graduate, whether it's high school or college. Um, with our college. American Indian mm-hmm. students, yeah. we have kids who are given an eagle feather by their tribe, and that's a, a point of respect. Mm-hmm. And yet... We had many high schools in our state that for many years did not allow any divergent divergent from the standard cap and gown that a student wore. What is with our our country and our culture that we think everybody should be the same? It's it's, that it is, it should be. And yet here we are. Mm. And in Minnesota, now we have legislation that guarantees the right of a student to dress um, and to acknowledge their cultural heritage. Why we would have to have legislation. Legislation. How we we got to that part. The fear that that comes from or the, I don't even know what that is, but let me me tell you what's popping up in my brain, right? Like in the business world, if you're going to do business in a foreign country, you're going to have sensitivity training. When I am a student, that's right. Earn, that's right. Yes. Student, I had sensitivity training of take your shoes off when you come into the mm-hmm. house and how do you eat and the knife at the fork. Mm-hmm. And all that stuff. I remember mm-hmm. it. Absolutely. So, so I think, joy, absolutely, Joy, that competency, Good. cultural competency training, we need like a handbook. Yes. For how to handle yes. differences. And frankly, I think gifted should be in there and Dewey should be in there because I don't think people know what those two words are. Mm-hmm. I'm, I don't mean to laugh no. No. at you, Julie, but here's yeah, what I'm going to tell so you. Right. Joy so and right. I have been part of a project for the last 
I would say six to nine months. And we um, recently wrote a book that's in press right now that is on culturally competency, cultural competency in terms of instruction. And we broke, we broke this topic into three sections. And one had to do with the school mm -hmm. environment and the school climate and what goes on within the school in general. The second section has to do mm -hmm. with race, ethnicity, and culture, because we don't think that you can separate those. Mm -hmm. And the third section of the book is on sense of self and identity. And in that section, we, um, we've enlarged the, the, uh, the tent, as they say, to include not just students' mm -hmm. idea of who they are in terms of um, male or female, but our students who are trans students, our students who are gay students, our students who are questioning who they are and much more. Again, this whole idea of who comes into your classroom and what do you know about them? What do you know about their family? And unfortunately, we have to say this, have you taken the time to find out? And that I think is the biggest issue that, um, that we mm -hmm. face mm -hmm. is that we assume we've prepared our lessons. We think that everybody's going to be the same, but they're not. And we are mm -hmm. missing, but they're not we're missing mm -hmm. so much. We're missing the value of diversity. We're missing the richness of culture. We're losing out on an opportunity to really know students. And frankly, um, students, it's all interwoven. I don't think you can separate mm -hmm. students. Um, and Donna Ford uh, has said so very many times, and many of you know who Donna Ford is, but. Um, our, our students, you know, to paraphrase, our students are who they are 24-7. Um, we shouldn't force That's them <laughs> to become someone else in our classroom. I think, you know, you're hitting on, first of all, the assumptions is underlying everything. So, you know, mm -hmm. I'm just going to throw mm -hmm. it in there, but most people know that I'm a pretty observant Jew. And some people talk about anti-Semitism and anti-intellectualism. Absolutely. And those mm -hmm. come from a whole, you know, and, and, and really it's that taking the time to meet your student and establish the personal connection. And frankly, I even work with parents on this, That's creating right. a mm -hmm. personal connection with their child mm -hmm. because of all the assumptions that they have when they have their child that they expected them to go on this linear right. neurotypical mm -hmm. path and yeah. they're not. So personal mm -hmm. connection, like letting go of assumptions, mm -hmm. like I like to do steps. So step one is let go of your assumptions. Step mm -hmm. two is make that personal connection so you can mm -hmm. actually learn what is going on for that child. And then step three is to ask, what do you need to that child? Absolutely. Not only what mm -hmm. do you need, mm -hmm. but how can I support you? What can I do right. that would remove you? barriers that would allow you to have this access? Mm -hmm. um, Julie, you have mm -hmm. um, asked me at different points in time about the difference between opportunity and access. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm going to take just a, a moment because mm -hmm. I, I want to share this with you. You talked a moment ago about being an observant Jew. Um, over the years, I have... Um, I've had students who were, were provided with an opportunity to be recognized for an award or um, take a test, mm -hmm. uh, some sort of admittance to a high level course. And guess when it was offered? Saturday morning. Or it was <laughs> offered after school. The SAT and the ACT hmm. or, the, or before <laughs> school. And, and the reality mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. we have mm -hmm. students, and this is particularly true among of our, our, um, our students who come to us from uh, South America, and we have many, many in the United States and others. Um, 
where the emphasis is on community and not on individual. And so those children, those students mm -hmm. are going home to watch their, their younger brothers and sisters. Those mm -hmm. students That's don't right. have a way That's to right. get to school early, a way to stay late. Those students certainly mm -hmm. can't come on a Saturday morning because their parents are often working. Mm -hmm. But if they're observant Jews or they're mm -hmm. Muslims, they also can't come on a Saturday morning. So, That's even, right. you know, That's right. thinking about this, up, when people talk about opportunity, I always ask them to tell me what that really means. And they'll say, oh, we, we gave people four chances on four Saturdays to take the um, ACT preparation class. And it's only $40 or something like that. Well, first of all, mm -hmm. not only did we have students who can't get there, but frankly, that $40 is right. a real disincentive. $40 is that's the, that's the major. Huge amount that's of money. right. That's the yeah. assumption happening right And, and so right. opportunity yeah. is right. mm -hmm. access. Opportunity that includes access would mean that we're offering those courses without an expense. We're offering them so that they can occur right. during the school day so that everyone has equal mm -hmm, access. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it also means that we provide right. every mm -hmm. single student with an opportunity to gain the skills they need in order to be successful. So whether we're talking about mm -hmm. students of color, students who are immigrants from another country, students who are um, students who have what we would think of as a disability, some sort of a challenge, we need to be thinking about what's mm -hmm. keeping that student from participating? What's keeping that student from receiving the services that they need? What's keeping mm -hmm. that family mm -hmm. from being informed? And I'll tell you a secret, and that is that, frankly, most of the people who ask for their students to be assessed for gifted programs or ask and know to ask <laughs> their white people because they know, but no mm -hmm. one's reached out to say mm -hmm. to other families, did you know Black that families. this service, That's right? right. Mm -hmm. Do you know that these did services are available mm -hmm. and that your child is did very you? bright? Have we, Joy talks mm -hmm. about inviting families. I think it's more mm -hmm. than that. Sometimes we need to go pick them up. Sometimes we need to figure out what it is that's keeping them that is, participating. So I'm just the, what my walk away mm -hmm. from tonight is mm -hmm. would be this three step sort of process. One, get rid of the assumptions. You cannot simply cannot make assumptions. You can't so, assume cannot, that you don't know, right? Cannot mm -hmm. assume what we don't know. We don't know. Mm -mm. And then two is make a personal connection so you can find out that they have parents who work on Saturdays or that they observe a uh, something on mm -hmm. Saturday that can't be there or that they can't afford to, to this uh, access. And then third is, you know, what do you need and how can I support you? Can I add a fourth? Please. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. My fourth <laughs> is universal screening. Well, yes. And universal screening means mm -hmm. that we're Absolutely. taking a look. Yeah at mm -hmm. every single student mm -hmm. um, in my perfect world. Uh, it would be in probably in second grade, in fourth grade, and then sometime mm -hmm. in middle school before kids go on to high school. And it's not so much that I'm looking mm -hmm. for a label. What I really want to do is I want to find kids who will benefit from the opportunity to participate in gifted services. And again, it's like I said, it's mm -hmm. not about a label. Um, it's about how we can locate mm -hmm. these kids mm -hmm. and then support their talent development. And oftentimes when we talk mm -hmm. about multilinguals, people will say, oh, we're gonna wait a few years until he or she is fluent in English. <laughs> That's exactly the opposite. 
Yeah. Oh, it's the same thing. Was, mm -hmm. Straight we, up and sweet kid. We're going to mm -hmm. wait until they can get their right. hands under control before they give, we give them the... Exactly. And, and we see this um, with kids who have, uh, who are neurodiverse, but also have um, behavioral issues. If we could only get this under control, mm -hmm. if he could only mm -hmm. sit still in class, mm -hmm. if he'd only show up to class, you know, and all of these other pieces... Um, and that's where universal screening can really make a huge difference in our kids. Well, you guys, I, I want to add a fifth. Um, oh, Julie, ahead. before we stop, I want to add a fifth before we uh, finish this up because um, it's very important for us also to recognize, as Wendy said earlier, within many of our societies, one of our cultures, our non European cultures, that there's a communal communal notion about the way we live. And um, there are people in the community that we don't reach out to. And when I, in my research with black families in particular, they are church leaders, they are organizational leaders, they host programming, they know these kids in a way that school personnel just do not know them. And if we, go, if we reach out to those individuals, We'll also have a, a better sense of who these students are. We'll have a better process. We'll have places we can go to. This is why I suggest all the time, take the gifted, take the gifted and all of the programming uh, informational sessions that we do, take them out into the community, host them there, host it in their, their locations, their sites, maybe in the, um, the, the cafeteria someplace, you know, in another location, uh, take, take what we do to invite and advocate for people, take it out to where the people are. And community members, community leaders can do, can help us with that process. They can help us. All right. So, That's good advice. So we have the, the Wendy, Joy, and Julie five steps to uh, inclusion, I guess we're going to say, or equity. Okay. Number one, get rid of your assumptions. Equity. Number two, make a personal connection. Find out who this kid is in front of you. Number three, what do you need? How can I support you? Number four, universal screening. And number five, parental and community input. Oh, it's gorgeous. Now mm -hmm. we got to get people to do it. Now, Julie, the very first yeah. thing we can do is start talking about it. Yeah. Yeah. Start talking about it more. Yeah. This is you guys, well, you are you are you are mm -hmm. walking the walk. So mm -hmm. I I am so grateful for you <laughs> being here and staying with us as we dealt with our crazy technical difficulties. What we'll do is we will post <laughs> this and we will email it sure. to our lists and put it out there to the world and okay. people will share it and mm -hmm. this will get out to everybody who really needs to hear about this such an important. Mm -hmm. topic. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm not exaggerating. We're saving lives. That's what we're talking about. We're talking about saving lives. Right. Saving Truly lives. Mm -hmm. Saving lives. Thanks so mm -hmm. much for shining a light on this, Julie. It's Thank so you. Important. Mm -hmm. Really appreciate yeah. it. And the opportunity. I'm sorry mm -hmm. I coughed in the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. I wanted to make sure you were okay. <laughs> Yeah, I, I'm fine. Mm -hmm. But it was it was touch and go there with the allergy. 